Advent, the time leading up to Christmas, is a season of anticipating the coming of Jesus. How can this Christmas be different from past years? What if your heart was filled with hope? Hope that the broken world cannot provide. Love in a world marked by apathy. Joy as Jesus brings us out of sorrow and suffering. Peace, not found in humanity, but only in Jesus. What if this Christmas you experience Jesus' birth in a new way? Advent, the miracle that changed everything. Christmas. We'd like to, again, welcome everybody. We think it's an honor that you would hang out with us here at 601 Fair Street, or Fair Street, or if you're watching online, you're taking the time uh, to hang out with us there. Uh, so one of the things we'll let you guys know about next week is, uh, as you heard JC say, uh, is the Christmas shop. And we have, through the partnership with other churches and what you guys have done just on the Amazon list alone, uh, we've been able to purchase over 150 uh, gifts, which is really good. We have now up to, to, we've got about 78 kids who we have uh, going to be taking care of and helping them with their Christmas and uh, through the, a very different idea of creating a Christmas shop uh, where uh, parents and uh, guardians get to come and, and uh, pick out the things that they're uh, getting. It's not strangers, uh, toys for strangers. Uh, but one of the things we do is we still have about 95 gifts on the Amazon wish list. So if you know somebody or a neighbor or a coworker who says, hey, I'd love to help out a family or I'd love to help out um, – of some, somebody this Christmas. Uh, in the next couple days, we'll kind of be closing that out because they got to get here before Friday. Uh, but just to let you guys know, there's still some opportunity for that. Uh, again, a, a great way uh, to share the love of Christ uh, in our community as we talk about Christmas, not just being a hand out, but a hand up as we share the love of Jesus. As we talk about gifts, I want you guys to, to think about and process this, but what is the best gift you've ever received? Not just best Christmas gift. So let's, let's, let's go there. So like a best Christmas gift, like you remember, you can remember like where it was in your living room or where it was under the tree or maybe even what it was wrapped in. Or you might even remember the pajamas you were wearing when you came down and you saw the, the best gift ever. And again, the, the gift is not one that you played with for a couple weeks or it was a hot item and, and you played with it for a little while and then you put it up in the closet or you really never played with it again. But, but this was a gift that you spent just not only weeks and months, but maybe years playing with, maybe even decades, like you still have it. So I want you to think about that gift, and I want you to think about uh, maybe the memories you made with your friends or your buddies or that you used to go with, or maybe even your brothers or your sisters or your siblings, and, and what that gift might have been. So as we talk about beholding, we want you to kind of sit there for a second and just begin to think, man, what is the best Christmas gift uh, I've ever received? It really impacted you. Uh, I, let me share mine, and I, I kind of told Betsy it's not the best gift she's ever given me, but I got it in 1985. I was seven years old, and it was a Honda ZR50, all right? It was a motorcycle. It was about this big. It wasn't very strong, but it was a beast, and so uh, I, I was seven, and my, my brother was five. Uh, Betsy's like, we would never get our seven- and five-year-old a motorcycle, but my parents just lived on the edge, and we had about 80 acres, and we just had a pasture, and so, man, we spent, um, my brother and I spent many years uh, going, uh, jumping hills and going as fast as we could uh, through the pasture, uh, and we have lots of scars to show from it. One of the scars in my, on my hand right here is I have a scar. I was coming around my house, and around my house I came. I was able to slow down enough that I didn't go head first into a barbed wire fence. But I did not slow down enough to turn that I did not graze the side of my hand. So my hand had a big old scar. I have a big old scar on my hand right here from that motorcycle and all the memories that came with that. So as you think about your gift, as you think about whatever it is for you, so, so that's a gift that is still in my family almost 40 years later. My brother has it. He says he's going to rebuild it, and Trevor keeps asking when he's going to get to go ride it. Bessie said never. But the idea is, is what are you thinking about? What is it that, again, that you have um, that, that looks like? So today we're going to be talking about uh, Behold the True King, and we're going to talk about the wise men. We're going to talk about their gifts. We're going to talk about the three gifts that the wise men bring uh, to this newborn king. Uh, we're also going to be talking about um, the darker side of, of this part of Matthew 2, which is Herod. And we're going to talk about Herod and his response to uh, hearing about this, this new king. And as we talk about that, uh, what led him to, to desire to, to not only kill this, this innocent baby, but many, many, many others. 
So today, we, as we talk about Advent, and, we, and Advent is really this idea of this expectant waiting um, and this uh, the celebration of Christ's coming, uh, but then also the, the second coming of Christ. And what that looks like last week was hope, and, and we talked about the hope that we have in Christ and, and what that hope really looks like and, and the understanding of who Christ is, that our hope are not the fading things of this world of what we hope we get at Christmas or we hope we get that promotion, but it was a hope that Christ was. Today's about peace. And we're going to talk about the peace that comes with that because really the peace that Christ brings was why the wise men came. It's why they gave the gifts that uh, they gave. Peace is about why Herod responded the way that he did. And so as we talk about that, we talk about these gifts and this, this idea of worship, but it's just not the gifts that these wise men came, but also the response of Herod. That Herod was afraid of a, of a peasant child who was coming because, because there was something inside of him that knew that this meant something more than even just his own throne. But the peace that Christ was going uh, to bring was going to remove his power and fulfill our heart's desires. So we're going to be in Matthew 2 today, so familiar passage. Again, if you're, if you're new to church, uh, we're so glad that you're here. Uh, you can follow along in a Bible or your Bible app, or if you don't have a Bible, uh, you can follow along on screen. And so we're going to be in Matthew 2. We're going to first look at Matthew 2, verses 1 and 2. And it says this. It says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there's our word, behold. So listen, sit. What does this mean? Behold, the wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard about this, he was troubled in all of Jerusalem with him. So these guys have been watching this star and, and what it looks like. My family and I, this weekend, we watched the star movie, uh, which is about a donkey named Bo and pretty humorous and uh, all the good things that come with uh, good good Christmas uh, Christmas uh, movies. But the whole premise of the star was what we just read about. There was a star and these wise men come and this donkey helps Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus and all that good stuff. Now, here's one of the greatest debates in all of, uh, of, all of, of Christmas and really Christianity. Do you put the wise men in your nativity or not? Great debate. Because the movie Star, if I'm looking at it theologically, which you shouldn't, by the way, it says that they were there the night when Jesus was born. And most of us were taught that, and we went to Christmas cantatas, and we went to all these things, and the camels came walking in, and the wise men came walking down, and they had their gifts at the nativity. And the other side is that it was actually later, and that's, that's the side I go to, is that it's actually later. We'll look at why we believe that in a little bit. But a great debate is made, do I put my wise men like further? Are they in the next room because they actually weren't there in the nativity yet? Or where are they at in the house? Like where are they at? Um, so I just let you know if I walk in your house and I see the wise men at the nativity, I will refrain from picking them up and throwing them in the yard because we want to be, uh, we want to be cor correct in, our, in the way that we view where the wise men were. Just kidding. Wherever you put the wise men is great as long as we know. But let's talk a little bit of, of why the wise men were there. We don't really have time to go to the great detail of who these guys were. Um, it's really, when you do have the time, I encourage you to, to look back. But basically these guys were astrologers. They were astrologers who looked at the skies for answer. And back then, that was a big deal because they were studying the stars. They were studying the planets. They were seeing how everything aligned. And they were most likely from um, Babylon. Now, if that clicks in your head, it's because we talk a lot about Babylon, especially when we look at our Old Testament series that we do at Capstone. We've spent several series in understanding that Israel is taken into captivity. And in that captivity, God uh, teaches Israel a lot about not only uh, what it means to follow him, but their future. And ultimately, who Christ would be coming out of that. So they're in Babylon, and the Babylonians, the way they would conquer a people was they would take their, um, their theologians and their noblemen and the really smart people, and they would bring them to their capital. And in that capital, they would learn from these cultures. And, and one of the things that, that the, the Babylonians learned about was these um, Messiah prophecies. And so while they were telling them about it, they were writing this in their Babylonian history. They were writing this down in their books, and they were saying, hey, we want to learn about that. And so despite Israel missing that Jesus had come, the Babylonians, the, these, these wise men, had go, hey, remember many, many years ago, hundreds of years ago, when, the, when those Jewish, uh, the, the Jewish nation lived in our, they told us about this. 
They told us about this star that would come, and this star would mean something greater than just a brighter light, but it would actually be a star that would move, which would show it was something not natural, but actually was something that was unnatural. So they go from ba- probably from Babylon to Jerusalem, um, and then quickly you need to know that that was not an easy trip. It was not comfortable. It was one that had its own challenges because it was 800 miles. So the wise men did just not get in their car and go to grandma's house over the river and through the woods, okay? They literally had to pack everything up, go 800 miles. If they're knocking out 200, uh, two, if they're knocking out 20 miles a day, it would have taken them probably 40 days on camels, in the desert, sandstorms, uh, elements, bandits, all these things, ultimately to come to something that was a theory that they were just going, okay, well, these, these Jewish people told us a long time ago that it would be a king. So we're looking, and, and what they said seems to be true. So we're going to go 800 miles, and we're going to take gifts to this newborn king. Side note, sometimes we need to realize that coming to worship Jesus is not always easy, but it's always worth it. So as we think about as we come and, and, and some of the things that, that we get to see. So... They roll up into Jerusalem. Man, they go into the throne because they're very royal-looking guys. And so they say, hey, we're here to see the king. And uh, so King Herod's like, all right, got some people from Babylon coming to see me. Oh, and they got gifts. All right. Everybody likes gifts. So they come into, and, and, and King Herod's there on his throne, and they lay the gifts down. And, and, and he says, well, thank you very much for the gifts. And, and the wise men kind of look at each other and go, no, 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 no. These aren't for you. It's for the newborn king, the new king. Of Israel, the star. We 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 remember what they said in the uh, what your um, what your priest and had told us about. And there's a silence, awkward. Uh, there's an awkward silence, and, and King here's like, "Well, I got news for you, boys. You, you must have got your wires crossed because I'm the only king of Judea. The Roman emperor himself has put me over this this area, so there's no other king. So I think you guys must have gotten mixed up." Actually, why don't you guys go ahead, why don't you spend some time in Jerusalem, go sightseeing, hear some coupons to some great shows. You guys go do that, and I'm going to, I need to actually connect with some of my, my wise guys. I'm going to hang out with them and see what they say. So he brings his guys over and says, hey, hey, are they talking about the Messiah of the Old Testament? And so they get together, and they go back and look at the Old Testament, and they bring up Micah 5, 2. Which in your gathering insights was one of your uh, prophecy questions last week of, of look this up and see where it came true in the New Testament. In Micah 5, 2, it says, uh, it says, look, it says the Messiah will be born in the town of Bethlehem. He goes, hmm. All right, well, get, bring, bring the wise men back in. So the wise men come back in, and, and he's like, hey, you, got, you guys go ahead and pick up your gifts. You guys, can, you, you, you stopped a little early. So what, what my wise men are telling me is that you guys need to roll on down to Bethlehem. And there you're going to find the newborn king. But here's the thing. I want you to make good notes and come back and tell me when you find the newborn king. Because when you find the newborn king, I want to bring my own gifts to him. Now, the wise men had heard in town that, uh, that Herod had not, was not the most what you would call reputable leader. That he had actually killed a, a wife, some children, some relatives who had threatened his throne. So they had come in very eagerly to see the king, and now they come in very nervous about what he's saying. So they pick up their gifts, they get back on their camels, and they head towards Bethlehem. All right, now let's jump back in into verse 9. It says this. It says, after listening to the king, they went their way. And behold, there's our word again, behold. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came rest to rest over a place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child. Going into the house, not the stable, not the barn, not the cave. He went into a house. And they saw the child with Mary and his mother. And they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening the treasures, they offered him gold, gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country. So we have this great picture of, of these wise men showing up with great joy in their hearts. So remember, they showed up to Jerusalem thinking that was it. They were eager and excited, and then they went back to fear and kind of a little trembling, not really sure that this guy's he's kind of a loose cannon. But now they're filled with this joy because they realize that the star has stopped. And they go and they, they go find this, this newborn child. 
and they realize there's something special. They, they realize that, that Herod is a pawn of the Roman Empire. This is truly a king, a royalty, supernatural. He was special. And Mary and Joseph are surprised as well. They hear a knock on the door. They, they had found maybe a one-bedroom apartment because they, were, they actually had found a place, and they were kind of waiting for where to go next. They didn't really know. And so they were raising baby Jesus and not really knowing what the next steps were for them. And there they hear that knock at the door, and they go, and there's this, this royal uh, entourage there. And they're like, who are you here to see? They're like, we're here to see the newborn king. And time had kind of faded, maybe, maybe months, maybe even a year. The idea of it, because they, they got really excited about the angels and Gabriel and, and the shepherds. And, but all that had kind of faded, and they had kind of been some silence, not really knowing what was next. And now these wise men show up with these gifts. And so they knocked on the door, and they not only they came to worship. And notice they didn't do that with Herod. They didn't bow down and worship Herod, but now they see baby Jesus, and now they're like, hey, something is, is special about him, and th then they give him the gifts. So let's spend a little bit of time on what these gifts were. They were valuable. They were very expensive. They don't give their leftovers. They bring these first fruits of a, of a true king. So the first is gold. Now, gold's pretty standard today. We understand it's very um, very valuable, and it was a sign of royalty. So if you're taking notes, gold was a sign of royalty. So the, the royalty that, that he truly was a king. The next is the frankincense. Now, frankincense isn't something that we normally play with or dabble in today, but it's a rare, expensive fragrance made from the trees in India and Arabia. This is a, a fragrance that was often used by priests and a cleansing. And so the idea that this was a symbol that he was a priest of the Lord. And go back to Hebrews, that he was the, the priest of the nations and what that looks like. So we see that there's this symbol of gold, which he is a, a royalty. And this next, that he's a, a priest of the Lord. And then we have myrrh, which is another rare, costly perfume that was made from thorn bushes in Arabia and Ethiopia. That should maybe give a clue when you hear thorns. Made from thorn bushes in Ethiopia. It was an anointing oil, but it was actually used in the embalming of bodies. Now, myrrh is kind of the oddest gift because it was not on the top ten amazing uh, Amazon gifts to bring to, to a, a, a baby shower. That is not what you, but we you know what we should bring. We should bring myrrh. That's not really, that's not, should we go with myrrh or the boppy? I don't really know. All right, so the understanding that this was a sign that this was a foreshadowing that Christ would die on the cross. This was a sign of his humanity. That yes, he is a king of kings. That he is a priest of all priests. But yet in the end, he will not climb a throne, but he will climb a cross. And so we see this. And I, one of the great questions I want to ask if I ever, you know, when I get in, if I get before the, the, the wise men, they're like, here's the wise men section. It's like, hey guys, how did you know? How did you know that myrrh was going to be a foreshadowing of who Christ would be? They were like, well, we were all out at the store, and so myrrh was the last thing, and so we just ended up bringing that. We didn't really understand it either. I don't, know, I don't know, but I think that's a crazy, not just coincidence, that they bring myrrh as a gift to Christ. And so as we talk about, uh, we don't really know what happens. We don't know how long they stay, but they probably stay more than one day. They probably stay maybe a week, maybe two. They share many meals with uh, Joseph and Mary and baby Jesus, and they get to know baby Jesus. And, man, they're, they're worshiping him. And, and even though they may not even be people of Israel, they're God-fearers. They know that God is doing something in and through them. But as they leave, they get that dream. They go home a different way. Joseph gets a dream as well. He's told to flee to, uh, flee to Egypt. Now, he flees to Egypt because danger is coming. Danger and death are coming. Let's read in verse 16 of what the fears of Herod are going to bring. Verse 16 says this, then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious and he sent, he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem in all the region who were two years or under, according to the time he had asserted from the wise men. So here we see again, this understanding that genocide has come to Bethlehem. Most scholars believe the size of Bethlehem at that time, uh, between uh, 35 and 40 young boys were killed in this time period. Well, Walt, thanks for the Christmas cheer. Appreciate that. I thought this was supposed to be about peace, and you're talking about genocide. Like, what does this mean? Like, why is this even in the Christmas story? 
the ups of, of these wise men coming and bringing these amazing gifts that last, uh, that left a lasting impression, the foreshadowing of who Jesus was, but then also the, 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 de the, the depths of death and evil that we see in King Herod's heart. What does this mean? Why is this even in the story? Are you, and by the way, you should always ask this question when we read this of what does it mean for me? Like, what does this mean for me? What, what, what does God want me to hear from this? All right, you may be watching or you may be here and you're not even a, you know, a Christ follower. You're just kind of checking things out this Christmas. You come to church. You may ask the question, why did God even allow that to happen if you believe in such a great and loving God? Why would he allow 35 to 40 children die? That doesn't make any sense. That doesn't seem like a loving God. So let's start with this question of, well, where does evil come from? If this was an evil act, where does this evil come from? Did, did, did this God okay this evil action? It's a great question. That, these are questions we have to wrestle with. These are questions we can't hide from. And just to be honest, at, at Christmas, we don't like to answer these questions. We like to sing our carols. We like to drink our hot chocolate. We like to do all these things, but really ask these questions. Because I have something today. I think God's going to teach you something that you never even realize. So first of all, we looked at Psalm 146 in our Thanksgiving a couple weeks ago, and, and we saw that God, uh, opp he opposes those who, who oppress the poor, those who rain down injustice on the vulnerable, those, those who take care of the, those who can't and hurt those who can't take care of themselves. Jesus is a, a, God is a God who loves those people and takes care of them. He opposes the people who, who do anything to those who can't take care of themselves. Well, if that's true, well, then where did the evil of Herod come from? Well, Scripture says that, he lo that God loves those who can't take care of themselves. Scripture also says that out of the hearts of men, murderous thoughts come. And so as we think about the, the response of where does evil come from, it ultimately comes from the sin in us. And here's the fact. is that King Herod's reaction to Christ's birth is a picture of all of us. Despite our hearts being broken over verse 16, that we see that he went and killed all the little boys under two, that we all have a piece of Herod in our heart. We all have a little piece of Herod in our heart. This is what it says in Romans 3, 11. We looked at this this summer. It says, there is no one righteous, not even one, that we are born sinners. Unlike Jesus, who was born sinless, that's the whole miracle of the Holy Spirit and Mary, that, that, because he wasn't born of human interaction, but he was born of the Holy Spirit, and which means he was born sinless. We are born sinners. Nobody has to teach us to be sinners. We are really good sinners. Ask any two-year-old. Any two-year-old. Toddlers, man, that's about when the time that they get it, and you tell them no, and they look at you with that cute grin, yet mischievous grin. You tell them no, and they go, and do exactly what you told them not to do. That is a sign of sin. Which is why at our house, we said we never negotiate with terrorists or t toddlers. Because they are the same. They will take you and they will wring your neck. So don't, don't negotiate with, if you're a parent, don't, don't negotiate with terrorists or toddlers. But here's the core of it. Whether it's a toddler or a terrorist or King Herod or you and me. In our hearts, here's our response. And this is the evidence of sin. No one tells me what to do. Nobody tells me what to do. This is my throne, and I will do whatever it takes to protect it. No one tells me what to do. And so it, when we ask the question, where does evil come from, that's it. That little thing inside of all of us that says no one's going to control me. No one's going to put me in confinement. No one's going to limit what I can or cannot do. And so whether we like to admit it or not, just like Herod was willing to fight to stay on his throne, so will we. So will we. We will stay and we will do whatever it takes because we have that piece of Herod that is in our hearts. And I will confess, I have that. There are times that I want to control things. I, uh, directions during Christmas mean nothing to me. I am smart enough to put this together, right? Right? You don't have to tell me how to put that together. I'm smart enough to put that together. No one tells me. Or maybe it's your work. I've been doing this long enough. Nobody tells me how to do my job. I can figure it out. Or I'm smart enough. 
And so it might be work, it might be family, it might be politics. Both sides of the aisle have control issues. Nobody tells me what to do with my guns. Nobody tells me what to do with my body. Both sides of the aisle have control issues. But ultimately, it's not a political thing. It's not a work thing. It's not a control issue. All of it are hard issues. All of it are hard issues. Now, the fact of what we see here and the response of this newborn king and being understanding of what it meant is that we lack peace because we want to control everything. The chaos that dwells in our life is because we want to control it. We want to control our kids. We want to control our finances. We want to control this, this, and this. And ultimately, we never allow God to give us the peace of not having to worry about that, trusting him. And that's when Christ came. Christ's coming wasn't just, Herod, wasn't just about removing Herod from his throne, but it was about removing us from ours. And that's, what, that's, that's the struggle. That's the tension. Jesus did not come to serve you. He came for you to serve him. But if we're trying to control everything, when we read something in scripture we don't like or we don't think is fair, we think we can just go, ah, I'm just going to ignore that. I'm not going to really believe that truth. Tim Keller says this in, on his book on Christmas. It says, it says, if the son of God was really born in a manger, then we have lost the right to be in charge of our lives. Behold that. Behold and sit and soak that in, that if Christ really was the newborn king and he is in that manger, it means that he came to bring peace. He gave that we relinquish control of our lives and we give to him. We acknowledge we are sinners in need of a savior. And it doesn't come from us controlling everything have everything picture perfect or the idea that everything's going to work out the way that we want it because we can't control the economics we can't control the politics we can't control what happens at our job we can't control other people here's the only thing we control our response is it in christ or is it in us and too many of us in the church respond in the way that we want to respond not in the way christ wants us to respond i can't control anybody else i can only listen to the holy spirit that dwells in me and my response so here's the three things that, that we get at the peace of Christ if, if we truly give control. First is um, peace with God. Peace with God. We were the ones who rebelled. God didn't leave us. We were the ones who rebelled. We were the one that says, no one controls me, even you, God. That's what, Ad, that's what Genesis 3 is all about. You can't tell me not to eat that fruit. It was a control issue. We still wrestle with that control issue even today. But ultimately, because we have peace in Christ... That Christ settled our debts. We're no longer enemies. We're no longer rebels. We're no longer prodigal sons and daughters. He has welcomed us home because of what Christ has done. The peace that we have with God has made us whole. And so first of all, we have a peace with God. Second, we have a peace within ourselves. Peace within ourselves. So we have this battle raging inside of us, of our identity. Uh, of who we are and, and what we should look like and what we should do. And the world tells us to look this way or the, tells, the world tells us we should respond this way. Or the world says, hey, we should all be fair. Or, you know, the, the, the whole thing revolves around we, there's this tension inside of us. But ultimately, we, we talked about this again in Romans of design versus desire. That there's this battle inside of us. But when we give and submit to Christ, then the, the battle is won. The identity crisis is over. We are his. It's no longer just about losing control because we've given control over to Christ. So, God, God, I'm willing to go wherever you want me to go. I'm willing to respond the way you want me to respond. I'll, I'll parent the way you want me to parent. I'll, I, I will play this sport or go to this college or I will do whatever, whatever you, where you are in life. Ultimately, like, okay, it's not about what I want to do, but Christ, what do you want to do in and through me? Galatians 2.20. Scripture that changed my life forever. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, which means I don't have control, which means now I have peace. I have peace because I'm now at peace with my God. I'm now at peace within myself because I'm not trying to earn his love. I'm not trying to be better. I'm not trying to be a good person. Being a good person is not what Christ came to die for. He, ca he died so that we were dead and now we're made alive. Because we hear that and process that, it's just not peace with God, peace with ourselves, but then also peace with others. Peace within ourselves and peace with others. 
Here's the thing. A lot of times we're consumed with being right. We're consumed with being right. And so ultimately we want to control others. So it's the idea of going, hey, you need to act this way or you need to do this or you need to do that. We want to control others. But when I look at the Gospels, Jesus didn't try to control people. He just simply pointed them to the Father. Yet many of us are more concerned with winning battles and debates than simply pointing other people to the Father. Because we want to control. But when we have peace and we trust the sovereignty of the Lord, we just simply say, hey, I, I, I want to I wanna follow you and, and I trust whatever happens. So I'm going to share the gospel with this person. You know what? If, if they don't accept it, I'm okay with that because I believe in your sovereignty. All right, I'm not going to feel guilty because of this, because I believe in your sovereignty of what you're doing in and through everyone. And so I just want to be obedient, God, with what you call me to do, because I can't control what everyone else does. I can't control how you respond to this message. I can't cont control what you do. But all I can do is simply be obedient to have this peace with others and to begin to build this bridge back to the Father. So as we think about that, the wise men, they have these amazing gifts. And so you go back to that gift that transformed your life. Or the, the gift that impacted you in a mighty way. These wise men, they bring these gifts and they think, man, we're going to be really good because we're bringing this king gifts. But ultimately, they left on their way back to Babylon and they realized that they had just been the presence of the greatest gift. That they had peace. They had a peace that they had, that they had found this newborn king, this true king that was just not a gift for them, but all of humanity. A familiar Christmas uh, carol we sing says this, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconcile. This line of this carol is a picture of really what this gift of peace is. Is that this reconciliation has happened? Or um, the word peace, shalom, the Hebrew word for shalom, and we, I, I love that word. And normally I talk about it on this Sunday, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time. But that word shalom means complete reconciliation, just not peace, not just the absence of battling, but a wholeness, a completion, or a reconciliation. And so when we talk about peace, it's just not the idea that I don't have issues, or I'm just not battling with someone, or fighting with someone, but I am complete. And this Christmas, you may not feel complete. This Christmas, you may be struggling with that. And can I say, it might be because you're trying to control something that you weren't intended to control. You're allowing that Herod on your sit, seat on that throne to try to say, no one controls me. Unwillingly, you may just go, hey, you know what? I know more than God. But what does shalom look like? Peace, reconciliation. Here's your big idea. If you're new to Capstone or you're watching for the first time, um, a big idea is just what we try to say, hey, here's a big picture. You can share it, have conversations, but it's just simply this. The peace of Christ that, bring, that Christ brings us removes the peace of Herod in our own hearts. The peace Christ brings removes that peace of Herod that dwells in us, that little, that little thing inside of you that tries to control everything. When Jesus says, come, leave it at my feet. Trust me. Let me guide you. And so just allow that to soak in. Behold this big idea. Sit, soak, process. This peace that Christ brings removes that peace of Herod in our heart. So what have I said over the last 30 minutes that, that might have stung a little bit? That might have been made you, made you go, ouch, that hurt. There may be something that I said that the Holy Spirit is just beginning to kind of stir inside of you. Did you realize maybe you had more Herod in your heart than you thought? Maybe you're realizing you have more control issues than you realize. Or maybe it's the idea that you're just lacking that peace. Maybe you're more concerned with other, what other people think about you than what Christ says or what has done for you. What is it like for you if, you if you were with those wise men to come and, and to knock on that door and to see this newborn king and to realize the Holy Spirit is in that place and he is doing something special and he's invited you into that story? That's what peace looks like. Not consumed with the things that you can't, take, that you can't control. That's why so much chaos dwells in us is because we think we can control all these things. But we lack peace. Or was it just simply knowing that God loved you and sent Christ? And that was enough.
that Christ went to the cross for you and defeated Satan's sin and death for you. And that was enough. Or the idea that your job isn't to try to control people morally, spiritually, but just simply point people to the Father. And that was enough. That's what peace looks like. The beauty of peace is that it grows. When I think about the senior saints, the, the men and the women I, I look up to and who, who've gone through tragedy or who've gone through some difficult times, or I just look at their life and, and realize that they don't blink. They have the courage that is, is, is crazy. They have faith that's, that's just mount, that can move a mountain. I realize that their faith has grown. Their faith with their peace that they have. The peace they have with their father. The peace they have of Christ in them. And the peace of not worrying about what other people think about them. Their peace grows. And I think that's one of the things we need to take away. No matter where you are on this journey of being a Christ follower, whether you're still discovering it and you need that peace, that initial peace, or, or you're just beginning your walk and, man, there's still so much chaos and baggage and you're still dealing with that and, and you're longing for more of that. Or you've been a Christ follower 50 years and you're seeing that peace grow even greater, but God's not done with you yet, and he wants that peace to grow even larger, maybe even share your peace. But, man, here's where I didn't think we were going to make it out. And, man, through the peace and the faithfulness of the Lord, here's where we did, and that gives us peace. So this Christmas, what does peace look like? What does peace look like in the sense that you're not sitting on the throne, but Christ is? That Christ didn't come to remove Herod from his throne. But he came, to remove her, he came to remove you from yours. That you're not the center of the story. Jesus didn't come to serve you. He came so that you may serve him as king. The greatest gift that we could ever receive. The peace, as Paul would say, that surpasses all understanding. No matter what comes our way, no matter what the world throws at us. So take a minute right now. The question we like to ask always is, what's God saying and what are you going to do about it? It's just not to listen to a message, but what are you going to do about it? Maybe just write down, go to our Gathering Insights on our app, and there's some questions there. Maybe you need to write down how you have been blessed. Maybe the peace that you have. Or maybe you need to say, hey, here are the things that are controlling me right now, and I need to really spend some time praying about that. We don't think this, this is just the beginning of this journey. It's not a 30-minute sermon. But it's that throughout this week, how's the Holy Spirit going to bring you back to that that little hair that dwells in all of us and allow Christ's peace to remove that. What does that look like? Begin to process that. What do you need to do? What do you need to, again, we want you as disciples, developing disciples to grow in this. And we really believe it's life-changing. Not only for you, but your family, for your neighbors, for your lost coworker, for the people who dwell around you to have the same peace that you have. Let's pray. We're so glad that you joined us online this morning for worship with our Capstone family. Uh, today we talked about peace, and uh, our big idea was the peace that Christ gives us removes the peace of Herod in our heart. Again, thanks for watching online. Uh, we would love to connect with you, and we can do that by our social media, our website, which is capstonechurch.net, or we'd love to see you in person. Have a good day.